Topic 5, Forces, Density and Pressure. Let's go through the main points in the syllabus first. Uh, types of force, under types of force, we'll be talking about the force on a mass in a uniform gravitational field and on a charge in a uniform electric field. We'll also talk about upthrust acting on a body in a fluid and we'll discuss frictional forces and viscous, excuse me, we will discuss uh, frictional forces and viscous forces including air resistance. We will also understand that the weight of a body may be taken as acting at a single point known as its CG or center of gravity. And then we'll move on to the turning effects of forces where we'll talk about the moment of a force and we'll deal with the definition of a couple, what it is, and then we'll talk about uh, the torque of a couple. And then we'll move on to equilibrium of forces. We will state and apply the principle of moments. And uh, we will deal with the idea that when there is no resultant force and no resultant torque or no resultant moment, a system is in equilibrium. And we'll also use a vector triangle to represent uh, coplanar forces in equilibrium. In the last section, we will talk about density and pressure. We will define density, we will define pressure, and then we will derive from the ideas of density and pressure, the equation delta P equals to rho G delta H, and we'll perform a few calculations. There are quite a few words in the next few paragraphs. We need to read them carefully to get a solid understanding. Now, let's start, yeah? A mass in a gravitational field, again, a mass in a gravitational field experiences a force. Now, so here, I have indicated the Earth's surface and I've also indicated the gravitational force. Now, let's read on. The important thing so far, a mass in a gravitational field experiences a force. And here I've got a mass, a little ball here, okay? And let's just darken it a little bit. Okay. It experiences a force. The size of the force depends on the gravitational field strength and the mass of the object. Now, we're going to use F equals to MA. Yeah? So, the size of the force will depend on the mass M. And the gravitational field strength, the gravitational field strength, we will use G. Okay, so we can write F equals to mg. Again, F is the force or the weight, M is the mass of the object, and G, the gravitational field strength. Now, near the surface of the Earth, okay, near the surface of the Earth, the gravitational field is uniform. Therefore, the force of gravity is uniform. Again, near the surface of the Earth, the gravitational field is uniform. Therefore, the force of gravity is uniform. Therefore, the acceleration due to gravity is uniform, constant, yeah? 9.8 meter per second squared or 9.8 newton per kilogram. So, we like to write it as G equals to 9.8 meter per second squared, the acceleration due to free fall. Note, weight is the same as the force of gravity and we like to indicate weight using W and W equals to mg. We have seen this before. Just like we have the gravitational field strength for a gravitational field, we have electric field strength for electric fields. What is an electric field? It is a region in which charged objects experience a force. Charged object, objects means a positively charged object or a negatively charged object. So, that's an electric field. So, 
electric field strength at a point is the force per unit positive charge placed at that point in the field. I'm going to read that line again. Electric field strength at a point is defined as the force per unit positive charge placed at that point in the field. Now the units for electric field strength will be Newton per Coulomb or volt per meter. So this is your definition for electric field strength, F over Q. So you can, uh, that's from this definition here, force per unit positive charge. So electric field strength will be F over Q. And we can also write F as equals to QE just by rearranging the equation. From this formula here, you will get your units Newton per Coulomb. I will talk about this volt per meter in a minute. Again, before we leave this, yeah, uh, electric field strength is a vector quantity uh, with direction given by the direction of the force on a positive charge. Just to draw a parallel between gravitational field strength and electric field strength, remember this is your gravitational field strength force per unit mass okay and compare that with your electric field strength which is force per unit charge now here we have a system of parallel plates this v here is the potential difference across the plates and d is your plate separation that is the distance between the plates and we can write electric field strength as equals to v over d that's how we get volt per meter. Now let's read these two lines. Electric field in between two large parallel charge plates is uniform. So the electric field between these two parallel plates is uniform. You can think of it as constant. Therefore we have the electric force acting on the charge is therefore uniform and we have acceleration that is uniform. Just a few more remarks about this electric field between two parallel plates. This electric field is, number one, it's uniform. So between parallel plates, let's just label this as positive and negative. Because we are dealing with an electric field that is uniform, what we'll do is we will use parallel lines equal, equally distant apart. Yeah. Again, we will use parallel lines to indicate the electric field and these distances are all the same. That is to indicate that we are dealing with a uniform electric field. Then what we do, we look at this line here because we know it's a vector quantity and the direction of the electric field strength okay, is uh, given by the direction of the force okay, on a positive charge. So what you do, you place a positive charge here and you know it's going to move downwards. Why? Because this is your negative plate. So if you move towards the negative plate, therefore your electric field lines will be, this will be the direction. Okay, that's what you see here. Good. Now let's consider a moving charge entering into a uniform electric field again. Now let's consider a moving charge entering into a uniform electric field. So first the picture on the left, we have a positive charge moving into this uniform electric field. Now the force on the charge is going to pull it towards the negative plate. This is a positive charge. So what happens is as it enters the electric field, the force on the charge is going to pull it towards the negative plate. This is the negative plate. Now as the acceleration is uniform, you'll find the path of this charge is parabolic. Now the reverse, if you have a negative charge moving into this electric field, now the force on this negative charge will pull it towards the positive plate. And because we are dealing with acceleration which is uniform, the path is parabolic. 
Next, let's talk about upthrust. Now, bodies wholly or partially submerged. Now, what does that mean? If you have, let's say, a water surface here, okay, this is the water surface, you can have an object which is wholly submerged or it can be partially immersed, okay? So, it can be fully submerged or partially submerged and let's read on, yeah? Bodies wholly or partially immersed in fluids. Fluids means what? Either liquids or gases. Experience an upward force called the upthrust. Due to the different pressures, due to what? Due to the different pressures exerted on their lower and upper surfaces. Okay, this upthrust is sometimes referred to as buoyancy force or just buoyant force. Now here on this on this picture here, on the left we have a cylinder in water. Now, the pressure in the liquid increases with depth. That's from this formula here, P equals to rho Hg. So if rho and G, rho is the density of the liquid, and uh, G is the acceleration due to gravity, so we will say that P is proportional to H. H is your depth. So as your depth increases, the pressure increases. Now, pressure in the liquid increases with depth. Good. So the pressure at the bottom of the cylinder here will be greater than the pressure at the top of the cylinder. Okay, because the bottom is lower than the top. So, pressure at the bottom of the cylinder bigger than the pressure at the top of the cylinder. Now, we know pressure equals to force over area. Now, the area is the same here, top and bottom. So, we will say the pressure is proportional to the force. So, we are saying that if your pressure goes up, your force goes up. Therefore, we can write, there is a bigger force acting upwards on the base than there is acting downwards on the top. Now, the difference in these forces, the difference in these forces is called the upthrust. Okay, so I just used FB to indicate buoyancy force will be the force acting upwards minus the force acting downwards. Next, let's talk about frictional forces and viscous forces, including air resistance. I've drawn a picture here indicating a box moving on a table, the motion of the box is to the right and straight off, let's learn how to indicate frictional force. I'm using FR for frictional force. Please note, frictional force is a boundary force. That means it acts along the boundary. That's the first thing, yeah? The other thing is frictional forces Okay, the other thing is frictional forces oppose motion. So notice the direction here. Yeah? This is to the left, motion is to the right. Good. Now I said uh, table is rough here so that we have the presence of a frictional force. Okay, let's read some uh, notes that I've written here. Frictional forces oppose motion. This resistance to motion is due to what? Is due to uneven contact between the two surfaces. That means the bottom of the box and the top of the table. That's what I've written here. Say the box surface and the table surface. Now, because of uneven contact between the two surfaces. When two surfaces are not proper, perfectly smooth, again, are not perfectly smooth, the lumps in them tend to interlock when there is relative movement between the two surfaces. Okay? The lumps in them tend to interlock when there is relative movement between the two surfaces. Now in this case, the two objects here being the box and the table. Let's explain this. We are looking at a microscopic, on the microscopic scale, again, on the microscopic scale, the surfaces are uneven, yeah? 
the surfaces are uneven. Just for discussion, let's say this is the box, okay, and this is the table. Okay, on a microscopic scale, the uh, surfaces are very uneven. They actually contact, okay, they are, they are only actually in contact at very few points. This means that the forces pushing the surfaces together act on a very small area. Again, because they are only actually in contact at very few points, uh, it means that the forces pushing the surfaces together act on a very small area. And we know that P equals to F over A. So when A goes down, P goes up. The pressure increases. So this creates a huge pressure. Yeah? This creates huge pressures that can weld the surfaces together. Okay, This huge pressures weld the surfaces together. To make the surfaces slide over each other, Okay, to make the surfaces slide over each other, we have to break these wells. Yeah? That's why I wrote here, to cause the surfaces to slide over each other, you need to break these wells. Now, this creates the frictional force, Fr. Note, frictional force here, it depends on the weight of the object and the type of surfaces in contact. Let's read this paragraph. We use viscous force, we use the term, again, we use the term viscous force to describe the frictional force in a fluid. Fluid means liquid or gas. Okay, we use the term uh, viscous force to describe the frictional force in a fluid. Now, the property of the fluid determining this force is the viscosity of the fluid. Oil is more viscous than water. We know that, yeah? Water flows easily, oil does not. Now, the viscous forces on an object moving through oil will be bigger than those on an object moving through water. Now, gases produce far less viscous drag than liquids. Example of a viscous force will be air resistance. Now we have a for your info thing here. Interchange of momentum between layers of moving molecules in fluids result in viscous forces. Now let's talk about CG. The center of gravity, CG of an object, is the point at which the whole weight of the object may be considered to act. Okay, make sure you know how to define the center of gravity. Okay, when you write uh, the center of gravity, these words should appear. Okay, point at which the whole weight of the object may be considered to act. In exams, uh, in exams we frequently see the phrase uniform body. For a uniform body, the CG is at its geometric center. Okay, uh, we have a little picture here to just reinforce the idea. We have uh, something rectangular. Okay, the object is a rectangular with length L and width W, and uh, the geometrical center is here. Geometrical center is here where the two diagonals intersect, and this is the CG. Through the CG, the whole weight of the object may be considered to act. That's what I mean by this W here. The whole weight acts through the CG. An object will always balance if you support it at its center of gravity. Now, for an irregular object, you can find the CG using a plumb line. We're not going to discuss it here, but just take note of it. Yeah. Let's look at an example. We have two objects, A and B. A is 10 kg. This is A and this is B. And A is 10 kg, B is 30 kg, connected by a string. Okay, connected by a string. 
and it's pulled along to the right, it's pulled along to the right, uh, the force applied is 80 newtons. And uh, the friction that A is subjected to is 10 newton. So that's 10. And the friction that B is subjected to is 20. Okay. So the friction on A is 10, the friction on B is 20, the force acting is 80 newton. That's the driving force. Uh, note there is a string that is connecting A and B. You have to calculate the acceleration, the tension of the string. Good. So let's indicate that here. This is T. So first, let's consider the system as a whole. Okay, let's consider the system as a whole. Let me write it here as a as a whole, and we will use F equals to m a. So when you consider the system as a whole, we are assuming that motion is to the right with acceleration a. Good. So when again, let me say that again. Yeah, when you consider the system as a whole, the T does not come in. Yeah, because the T here, one is acting on B, one is acting on A, so they have a cancelling effect. So T does not come in. So when you consider the system as a whole, uh, what we have is this 80 newton. We also have this 10 newton. We also have this 20 newton. Okay, so let's write that down. The resultant force will be to the right, 80 minus 10 minus 20. And that will be equals to the mass. Remember, we are considering the system as a whole. The mass will be 30 plus 10 will be 40 kg times A. So, uh, using a calculator, we have 80 uh, minus 1070, we have 50 here, equals to 40 A. Therefore, A equals to uh, 5 over 4 meter per second squared, which is 1.25 meter per second squared. To find the tension, uh, you can pick any one of the objects and draw a free body diagram. So uh, I've picked up B, okay, this is B, let's put in the free, excuse me, this is the free body diagram for B, let's plug in all the forces, I have a tensile component here T, again, I have a tensile component T in the string, I have the acceleration here moving forwards, which I know the value is 1.25. And then I have a frictional force, which is 20. Okay. So I am trying to find T. Let's use F equal to MA. That's what I've done here. The resultant force to the right. A is to the right. So resultant force must be to the right. T minus 20 equals to 30A. What is A? 1.25. Clean this up. T equals to 57.5 Newton. Next, let's talk about the turning effect of forces again the turning effect of forces first let's talk about the moment of a force okay the moment of a force about a point equals the force multiplied by the perpendicular distance of the line of action of the force from the point this is a very important idea so let's read it again the moment of a force about a point equals the force multiplied by the perpendicular distance of the line of action of the force from the point. Okay. So what does the moment give you? The moment about a point gives you the turning effect of a force about that point. Now moment is the same as Talk. Also, when you state the moment of a force about a point, please specify that point yeah, in your answers. So let's look at this, this picture. We have um, a force acting, which is F Newton. And um, we are looking at this point A. The moment about A will be the force times this distance D. Note. It is the perpendicular distance of the line of action from the force. Excuse me. The perpendicular distance of the line of action of the force from the point. This is what they mean. Okay. This is what they mean. So it will be the moment about A will be F times D. What are the units? Newton meter. Okay. Now in this case, 
the moment about A will be the force itself, which is F. Remember, we are looking at the perpendicular distance of the line of action of the force from the point. So this is the line of action of the force, yeah, this way. So we're looking for the perpendicular distance from the point, this one here, and that will be d sine theta. So it will be f times d sine theta. Note torque is a vector. So if the torque tends to provide clockwise rotation, then we take it as positive. Again, if the torque tends to provide clockwise rotation, then we consider it positive. Otherwise, we consider it negative. That means if it's anti-clockwise, then we consider it negative. So let's look at this picture here. I have a point A, I have a 5 Newton force, and I have 3 meters, the perpendicular distance of the line of action from this point. And you can tell the moment about A, let me just call this, moment about A will be 5 times 3 will be 15 Newton meter. Look, about this point is going anti-clockwise. Okay. Let's look at this picture here. I have point B, there's a 7 Newton force. The perpendicular distance from the point to the line of action is 4 meter. So my moments about B will be 7 times 4 will be 28 Newton meter. Now this thing is going to provide a clockwise moment. Okay. Clockwise about B. Can you see? You take a turn this way, clockwise. Okay. This one here is anti-clockwise. June 14, paper 1, 1, question number 11. The diagrams show two ways of hanging the same picture. In both cases, a string is attached to the same points on the picture. Okay. The string is attached to the same points of the picture and looped symmetrically over a nail in a wall. So, nail. The forces shown are those that act on the nail. Okay. In diagram 1, the string loop is shorter than in diagram 2. Uh, which information about the magnitude of the forces is correct. So let's look at my notation on the two pictures. Just take note, uh, on the left diagram 1, I've labeled this angle theta 1, okay, theta 1, theta 1, and this W is the weight of the picture. It's the same uh, picture, so we have W here and W here, and I've also labeled this angle here in diagram 2, theta 2. Okay, and also please note, because the string loop is shorter uh, in diagram 1, uh, it's mentioned in the question right here. In diagram 1, the string loop is shorter than in diagram 2. Because of that, you'll find that theta 2 here is less than theta 1. Okay, so those are the bare facts about this first before we start the analysis. What we're going to do is we'll start with diagram 1, okay? We'll start with diagram 1, and I have drawn here a free body diagram for the picture. I repeat, a free body diagram for the picture, and I'm considering the points where the string is attached, okay? I'm considering the points where the string is attached. Um, Remember, we are dealing with equilibrium, right? So, I've indicated my components. Now, I'm looking at vertical forces. Yeah? I repeat, this is from diagram 1. I am looking at the points where the string is attached. I'm also looking at the uh, vertical forces. Yeah? I've also indicated the uh, components of the tension, right? Because this is T1. So I have D1 here, and I have D1 here as well. Okay, good. So when I plug in the components, 
and knowing that I've labeled this as theta 1, so this vertical component will be theta 1, excuse me, t1 cos theta 1, and this vertical component will be t1 cos theta 1 as well. Again, this component here is t1 cos theta 1, and this component here is also t1 cos theta 1. Because we are considering equilibrium, let's look at the vertical forces upwards equals downwards. What's upwards? This plus this. So t1 cos theta 1 plus t1 cos theta 1 will be what? Good. 2 t1 cos theta 1. And that is balanced by the force downwards, which is W. Okay? Good. Now, if you write, uh, if you consider the same idea for diagram 2, Okay, if you consider the same idea for diagram 2, you will get W equals to 2T2 cos theta 2. Again, okay? you can draw that in yourself. Okay, If you consider the same idea for diagram 2 and you consider equilibrium of vertical forces, you will get W equals to 2T2 cos theta 2. Now, because this is W equals to this, W is equal to this, therefore you can write... This whole thing here will be equals to this thing here. You can drop the 2 and you will get T1 cos theta 1 will be equals to T2 cos theta 2. Okay? Again, T1 cos theta 1 will be equals to T2 cos theta 2. Let's leave it there. Then we'll go on to the nail in diagram 1. Okay? The nail. This one here. Okay? Let's consider the nail in diagram 1. Let's... Uh, look at the forces, the free body diagram, the forces acting on the nail. That's what you see here, okay? A slight mistake, it is not two, okay? This is one, okay? Okay, this is for the nail in diagram one, okay? So I have R1, okay? I have R1 here, and then I've got, uh, this is theta one, this is theta one, so I'm going to write uh, the condition of equilibrium again, okay, that's what I've done here, okay, consider nail diagram 1, nail diagram 1, so acting upwards is R1, what is acting downwards, correct, the component of T1 downwards, I repeat, R1 is acting upwards, the component of T1 here acting downwards will be T1 cos theta, and the component of this T1 acting downwards will be T1 cos theta. So let me write it here, okay, I have T1 cos theta 1, this will be T1 cos theta 1 as well. So R1 will be equals to this plus this, I'll get R1 equals to 2T1 cos theta 1. Now what is 2T1 cos theta 1? W. So R1 equals to W. Now you consider the same idea, nail in diagram 2, you do that yourself, right? I repeat, same idea as here, the nail in diagram 2, you will get R2 equals 2T2 cos theta 2. What is 2T2 cos theta 2? W. So you can write R2 equals to W, therefore R1 equals to R2. Good. So we know our response must either be A or B. Now we know theta 2 is less than theta 1, therefore cos theta 2 must be bigger than cos theta 1. Now from here, we can write T1 equals cos theta 2 over cos theta 1 times T2. Now because cos theta 2 is bigger than cos theta 1, then we can write T1 as bigger than T2. Therefore correct response B. Question number 12 man holds a 100 Newton load stationary. Stationary implies okay, equilibrium. So, a man holds a 100 Newton load stationary in his hand. The combined weight of the forearm and the hand is 20 Newton. That's shown here. This is the 100 Newton load. The forearm is held horizontal. Okay. And what is the vertical force 
F needed in the biceps. Okay, we are trying to find F. A few things. First thing is, because we are told it's stationary, we have equilibrium. Therefore, the principle of moments uh, will kick in. So what we're going to do is, we're going to take moments about X. I've labeled this point here X. Okay, I've labeled this point here X. So I'm taking moments about X. Or you can think about this as a vertical line through X. Yeah, You can think about it as a vertical line through X if you like. Okay, I'm just, I just fixed the point here X. Yeah? From which we start measurements of 4 cm and 10 cm and 32 cm and so on. Okay, so we're taking moments about x and applying the principle of moments, which means sum of clockwise moments equals sum of anti clockwise moments. Again, sum of clockwise moments will be equals to sum of anti clockwise moments. So clockwise moments will be uh, clockwise about x will be 20 times 10. Okay, this way clockwise and then I have got a hundred times uh, the distance from X to this line of action is 32 so 100 times 32 also this way okay clockwise moments and anti-clockwise moments will be provided by this force here F F times how much 4 so 20 times 10 equals to 100 excuse me 20 times 10 plus 100 times 32 will be equals to F times 4 Clean this up and you will get F equals to 850 Newton. Correct response, C. Question number 13. A spindle is attached at one end to the center of a lever of length 1.2 meter. That's what you see here. And at its other end to the center of a disc of radius 0.2 meter, that's what you see here, the disc, and then you see the spindle. A string is wrapped around the disc, passes over a pulley, and is attached to a 900 Newton weight. That's what you see here. What is the minimum force F applied to each end of the lever that could lift the weight? Okay, let's plug in some important things. We are looking at this 900 Newton weight so let's plug in the tension I have tension here so T here okay, T here will be equals to 900 Newton okay because we're dealing with equilibrium so T equals to 900 Newton and it's the same value here Okay, this is also T, which is 900 Newton. Okay, that's the first thing. Remember, we are trying to find the minimum force that could lift the weight. So at the point of lifting, we are dealing with equilibrium. And we are saying now that uh, looking at this weight of 900 Newton, it will provide the tension in the string of 900 Newton. And this is extended all the way to here because we are dealing with the same string. Okay. Having uh, said that, now let's look at the clockwise torque from the couple. Remember, this is F and this is F. So we have a couple and it is providing a clockwise torque. Okay. Okay. And that clockwise torque, we know to calculate it. It's just F times the distance between the two forces. It's 1.2. So this is what you have. The clockwise torque will be F times 1.2. And that will be equal to the anti-clockwise moment provided by this T yeah? this T here which is 900 Newton it is going to provide the anti-clockwise moment so anti-clockwise moment from the 900 Newton force which will be 900 times how much this distance here is 0.2 okay so anti-clockwise moment will be 900 times 0.2 so, minimum force, yeah, when clockwise moment equals anti-clockwise moment. Again, minimum force is when the clockwise moments equals to the anti-clockwise moments. F times 1.2 equals 900 times 0 0.2. Clean it up and you will get F equals to 150 Newton. Correct response, B. June 14, 
Paper 1-2, question number 13. The diagram shows four forces applied to a circular object. Which of the following describes the resultant force and the resultant torque on the object? Let's start with the resultant force. Look at the vertical forces. Yeah? Look at the vertical forces. This 45 Newton and this 45 Newton, one is going upwards, one is going downwards, so they cancel each other. Therefore, the vertical resultant will be zero. Then look at the horizontal forces. We have 30 Newton to the right here and 30 Newton to the right. Therefore, there is a resultant horizontal, there is a resultant force in the horizontal direction of 60 Newton. So if you consider horizontal forces, there is a resultant of 60 Newton. Therefore, the resultant force is non-zero. Then you look at the torque. You realize this 45 Newton and this 45 Newton, they are a couple. So therefore, looking at this system, they provide a clockwise moment. Okay, the couple provides a clockwise moment. Next, if you take moments about this point, if you take moments about this point, this 30 Newton force will give you a clockwise moment. Therefore, the resultant torque is not zero. So correct response, A, Resultant force non-zero, resultant torque non-zero. Question 18. Liquid Q has twice the density of liquid R. So I'm saying that the density of R is rho and the density of Q is 2 rho. At depth x in liquid R, the pressure due to the liquid is 4 kilopascal, which is 4,000 Pascal. So I'm using the formula P pressure equals to what? Rho H G. Yeah? Okay. So we're using the formula pressure equals to Rho H G. Let's deal with this first. At depth X in liquid R, the pressure due to the liquid is 4,000 Pascal. So you can write 4,000 equals to Rho. Uh, what is H? X and G. Okay. Good. At what depth in liquid Q is the pressure due to the liquid? 7,000 Pascal. 7 kilopascal is 7,000. I repeat, 7 kilopascal is 7,000 Pascal. So let's use the same formula. 7,000 equals to rho. In this case, will be what? 2 rho. Good. And uh, we're trying to find the depth. So let's use, use H again. We're trying to find the depth. So let's just use H. And of course, we have G. So from this equation here, okay, let's label this 2. From equation 2, you can write H as equals to 7000 over 2 rho G. I can rewrite this as 7000 over 2. Okay, I can write this as 7000 over 2 times 1 over rho G. Now we know from here, okay, from here, that rho g equals to 4000 over x. So you plug in 7000 over 2 times x over 4000. And you clean this up, you will get 7 over 8x. Okay, correct response B. June 14, paper 1-3, question number 13. What is the condition for an object to be in equilibrium? Again, what is the condition for an object to be in equilibrium? Textbook stuff. Correct response, C. The resultant force and the resultant torque on the object must both be zero. Question 15. 